Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Patrick Brown, professor at uh, UC Davis in the Plant Sciences Department. Only done a little bit of work in avocado over the years, but I have done work in almonds and other tree crops, uh, focusing on plant nutrition, uh, focusing on nitrogen management, uh, focusing on uh, soil health as well. So a variety of things. But in the realm of uh, biostimulants, I have kind of been busy in the last few years. Um, right back in 2012 uh, with some colleagues, we chaired the first Biostimulants World Congress and we're coming up on the sixth one uh, this year in Milan. So everybody's welcome to that one. And that Congress, we try very hard to keep it to the science and not a trade show, which is what a lot of the Biostimulant Congresses have turned into. I uh, also edited a book last year, Stimulants for Sustainable Production, and, and have a chapter in there on nutrient use efficiency of, and their interactions with biostimulants. And anybody who wants a copy of that, you just have to send me an email and I can share it for educational purposes. So don't hesitate to do that. I see a few people in the audience who've heard versions of this talk before. I promise I've thrown in some new stuff to keep it interesting for you. And it's going to be a little bit different than a typical presentation. I am going to go into some of the biology. Uh, and so for those of you who have already got your PhD in biology, I apologize for the simplicity of it. Those of you who don't, I promise there is no quiz at the end and everybody gets an A. So that should be, that should be. So anyway, um, we are seeing a lot uh, of development in the biological products. Uh, a lot of the major ag chemical companies are moving towards biologicals away from traditional. And we're going to see more and more of that in the coming decade. And the reason for that is largely consumer driven and heavily European driven. Most of these companies are international, multinational, and Europe has very heavily pressed a movement to biological alternatives, which biostimulants and biofertilizers are an important component. Now, at the moment, uh, the biostimulants and biofertilizers are treated separately. That's going to merge, and biostimulants are going to embrace both the um, uh, traditional biofertilizers as well as the Apologies for that. Um, so we got to start first with what the definition of a biostimulant is. And the only legislation that has a firm definition is Europe. And they define a plant biostimulant as a fertilizing product that has a function to stimulate plant nutrition processes. And I'll just leave it there by either influencing nutrient use efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stress, influencing quality or influencing availability of nutrients. Now, there's an important reason why they have emphasized this fertilizing product, and that's regulatory, because if they are regulated as fertilizers, then their use and their development becomes dramatically easier. The alternative to a fertilizer regulation would be a pesticide regulation. And right now in the US, there is a lot of arguments going back and forth as to where they fit. Just for your information, things like hormones, oxen, cytokinins, gibberellins are treated as pesticides. So there's some language in the, Euro, in the US uh, overarching language, the FIFRA language, that suggests anything that stimulates plant growth is a pesticide by definition. So you see a lot of lobbying going on, a lot of confusion in this realm, and a lot of interest amongst those selling these products to call them fertilizers. So that's why you will constantly see this relationship to nutrient use coming up on the labels and on the advertising material. Now, there's a big realm of these materials, many of which you're familiar with, the algae, most of you know Actigro and the seaweeds, uh, let me, sorry, the algae and the, like uh, Arcadian, uh, the humic acids like Actigro. Uh, there are also a lot of microbials. This is where the real growth is going to be in the industry. Uh, we see a little bit more animal-based and uh, hydrolysis. And you can still have inorganic materials amongst biostimulants. As I said, this is where the growth is going to be in the microbials. And we've already started to see a lot of that. Uh, and this has an interaction with your 
systems. And later on, we'll talk a little bit about soil health that inter interacts with this. The bottom line for all of this is this group of materials is clearly very diverse. We've got biological living organisms. We've got non-living coal extracts and synthetic materials. We've got mixtures many times with nutrients in them. We've got simple com com uh, molecules and we've got complicated molecules. The bottom line is, as I go through this, and if anybody tells you, I know how biostimulants function, you can look at this list and say, well, there's no way on earth that they share the same function. And it would be an error to think about biostimulants in that, in that fashion. They don't share the same function. That makes it more complicated. And as I go through this, you'll see, I'm gonna give you a lot of complication and not very many answers. I'm gonna leave all the answers to Gary at the end. Uh, and that's why he's laughing heartily. Uh, but I am gonna give him some explanation for why his answers aren't that clear either. All right, so back in 2015, we wrote one of the first sort of statements of hypotheses of what's going on. And it's basically a stress hypothesis. And it says that abiotic stress that separates it from biotic stress, which is pathogens, occurs in all environments. And as a consequence, yield rarely reaches its full potential. And amongst the abiotic stresses are things like nutrients, drought, temperature, frost deficiency. And for you, this is obvious. You do not always get 30,000 pounds of avocados or 20,000 pounds of avocados. It goes up and down like crazy. That's partially as a consequence of this. What biostimulants are hypothesized to do in that is enable plants to tolerate these stresses a little bit better. Enable plants to access nutrients and water in the soil a little bit more eff 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 effectively. Biostimulants also alter the microbiome of the plant. And of course, if they are microbial, then they're going to influence the microbiome of the plant. And that is possibly the mechanism that causes these effects. So we're gonna step through this a little bit so you can understand it and put it in the context of your cropping systems. So just in a, in a diagram, this is sort of a, what happens in most cropping systems. You have a yield potential, which is the genetics of the plant under the perfect conditions. As you go through the season, certain events occur. You get fruit drops, you get a temperature spike, you get a drought, and you lose a portion of that yield so that you end up with an actual yield less than the potential yield. The hypothesis for biostimulants is they act in this portion of that interaction mitigating how the plant responds to the stress event and influencing how much of the fruit in the case of avocado is retained on the tree. You can picture that a different way. These uh, maps, which are called a yield gap analysis, basically says the same information. On the left, this is the absolute maximum yield in your environment with your cultivar, everything done perfectly. This is sort of what the best grower in the best year gets. 20% less. This is what many growers in many years get, considerably less than the best grower in the best year. And this represents a gap, an exploitable yield gap, somewhere where you can intervene and make a difference and get the plant back to its very full potential. A warning here, and something not to forget, is that biostimulants are a supplement to your farming system. They mitigate some of these stresses, but they only do that if you're already farming well. Okay, so they support farming, they supplement farming, and they don't replace good decision making. All right, so now I'm going to get a little bit into the physiology and biology of this to kind of explain this phenomenon how a compound like a biostimulant can change the outcome when there's a stress present. So if you think about plant biology and plant metabolism as a whole, you have specific environmental conditions in which the plant is growing. The plant does have a monitoring system. So it knows what the temperature and the drought and the water stress is. And that monitoring system then alters how the plant distributes its energy. Okay, now we would like all of its energy to head off to reproduction. 
But remember, most of the plants we deal with, and certainly avocado and the tree crops I deal with, have not undergone, undergone a lot of breeding. They're really uh, closely related to their natural environment. And in a natural environment, when a plant uh, senses any stress, it will drop as many fruit as it can so that one or three fruit are fully fertile. Okay, that decision to drop is triggered by the plant's ability to monitor the environment. Now, of course, plants who do not know that next week is fertigation week and that they can relax and they don't need to drop all these fruit. And what a lot of the biostimulants uh, are perceived to affect is that signal. The should we drop them or should we keep them a signal? Should we push a new vegetative growth or should we retain re restrain vegetative growth? These are biological signals that can be manipulated. One second. Okay. So just uh, summarizing that, plants clearly respond to environmental stresses. One second, I have to hide my screen. All right. So plants clearly respond to environmental stress uh, by reducing reproduction, producing fewer, better seeds. We've got some questions is, how does the plant perceive this environment and what determines how it reacts? As system then in a natural ecosystem, an agricultural system, we want those our plants to not make these survival decisions, but to retain fruit as much as possible. And then the final question is, can we manipulate these? And if so, is there any evidence that we do? So I'm going to step up a little bit of a higher scale and ask about the system as a whole, because we tend to think about the individual plant when we do, when I do my research, but we should be thinking cropping system as a whole and asking the question, are our cropping systems um, resilient? Are they um, uh, producing as much as they can? Now, clearly in this example, water has been withdrawn on the left-hand side of the, of the farm here. You've got severe stress. We can't compensate for that. As I said, biostimulants can assist in a well-managed system. They cannot recover a badly managed system. On the right, properly irrigated and fertigated, but nevertheless, you're all aware that you get events in avocado production where fruit drop will occur. Explain why 20% of your fruit dropped off or why 80% of your fruit didn't, uh, your flowers didn't set into fruits or uh, and those sorts of effects is what we're really looking at. I'm gonna transition to a different system, but I wanted to do this to illustrate a linkage between biostimulants and soil health and cropping system resilience and resistance to stress. Now, here's a lettuce field in the Salinas, highly productive area, double cropped, triple cropped. And we can estimate from this how much photosynthesis occurred. What was the total capture of carbon in this cropping system? Now, if you think about this, you might think, well, it can't get any better than this. 320 days of growth, perfect 65 to 72 degrees weather, irrigated, fertigated, pest controlled. That number, 10 to 15. If you go to the Midwest and look at a prairie in the Midwest, native pasture, no irrigation, no fertilization, no pest control, their carbon yield is from 20 to 45 tons. Even though the growing season is only 200 days or less, depending on where you are, and there are no inputs. So the question then becomes, how can this system be so much better than that hyper-managed system that we see in the lettuce production? And the answer to that is, it's because in these systems, diversity of crops that you have, diversity of plants that you have, every single stage in the year and every single event in the year has a species that will perform. So the reason these systems are so good is because they have a diversity of species, but perhaps even more importantly, they have a diversity of microbes in the soil that are sensing this environment, responding to this environment and optimizing uh, plant performance.
We're going to come back to that and I'll show you what the relevance of this is for biostimulants. So what I want to do now, oops, excuse me, is talk a little bit about the microbiome, because as I said, biostimulants are now very heavily moving into microbiome and, bio and microbials as the primary source of uh, biologicals that are going to be used in this realm. So we need to talk about this a little bit so that you understand what it is and how it interacts. So all of the interest in microbiome pretty much started with the Human Microbiome Project. I just put a couple of things here. We've learned over the last 20 years that the microbes in your gut really do determine your health to a large extent. Diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, obesity, your perception of stress, and the subsequent health responses are all mediated through microbial pathways, okay? Even something as uh, trivial as whether you get eaten by the mosquitoes at the barbecue depends upon your microbiome. Interesting uh, result here, this is mice actually, and I, and I put this in just to illustrate, this is from uh, Nature, so a very high, high uh, reputation publication that illustrates that when you stress mice with all these different stress events, you change their gut microbiome and that causes stress response. If you take that gut microbiome, all the bugs out of the belly of that mouse becomes stressed. If you do the reverse from healthy to stressed, you stress. And the point I'm making here is this is a clear illustration that the microbial populations regulate the response of the organism. So that's animals, but what about plants? Well, the reality is, and even though we know less about than a lesser effect, why? Because plants and their bacteria in the soil and the environment have coexisted for almost a billion years and plants can't move. Whereas the animal microbe interaction is only 150, 200 million years. So you've got a billion years of evolution of the bacteria and the microbes and the microorganisms with the plant in a commensal or a symbiotic fashion. They depend upon each other, okay? Now, you know, we've mostly ignored this when we think about mycorrhiza occasionally. If you're growing a legume, you think about rhizo, uh, rhizo, uh, rhizobacterium, and you think of pests and diseases. That's such a tiny fraction of what's going on uh, that we are really at the realm of new biology right here. I try and tell my daughter in high school, this is the realm to go into. The details here don't matter. This is ju just an example of a root and all the different interactions that are going on. Tolerance of pH, tolerance of acidic acid soils, tolerance of uh, compacted soils. Tolerance of saline soils all have an interaction with the bacteria and microbes in the, in the environment. And what is happening is that many of the microbial populations in the soil are actually the sensing mechanisms by which the plant knows there is a stress. The microorganisms sense the stress, share a message with the plant which responds to the stress, and is mutually beneficial for plant and microbe. Now, all of that Just will come a little- Patrick, can I ask yep. a question real quick? Yep. In your previous slide, you have that we understand greater than 0, 0.0, that is- reversed. That should be a less than, sorry. Okay, nice Just want to make sure that people understand is that we know virtually nothing. <laughs> yep, thank you, thank you. And I've given this talk five times and nobody's seen that. But excellent. Okay. So just this, this is relatively new, though there is some evidence of this sort of thing. This is back in not so long ago, 2003. An interesting little test. You have these agar plates that many of you have seen use in microbiology. You grow a little bacteria on one side of that plate and you grow some uh, seedlings on the other side of this little plate. And what you see is this is the control circumstance and the plants look pretty wimpy here. This is one of the bacteria introduced, and you can see the plants are, in this case, tenfold bigger. Only by virtue of some uh, airborne signal being transferred from here to here, because there is no connection through the agar plate itself. 
So this should strike you as pretty extraordinary that a bacteria in the environment can so profoundly influence the growth of a plant. When I say uh, microbial biostimulants are where the emphasis is going, this is why. It's because, of course, you've got so many options in the microbe populations and microbial species to look at these interactions and these manipulations. Um, this is a recent paper. Uh, we don't need to go into the details, but it just emphasizes that every plant species has the ability to recruit a, a, a population of microbes that are specifically adapted to that plant, specifically adapted to official. Really is important for these reasons. And it has been argued in the biostimulant realm that if you've got ideal soil health, then the potential response to a biostimulant becomes less. What biostimulants sometimes appear to do is to make up for some of the breaks in this soil health connection that we should be emphasizing. So I like this picture sort of illustrates the purpose, the, the point, you know, the old fashioned sterilize your hands, keep your kids safe is wrong. You know, you do need to embrace and, and optimize your microbial populations for optimal health. Now, any of you who've got one-year-olds know that this pig now has a cold as a consequence of being licked, licked by this baby. But it's similar to agricultural systems. If you grow, this is almonds, so I can pick on almonds uh, because it's an avocado audience. Uh, when it's an almond audience, I'll put an avocado up here. But this sort of management where you've got a clear bare soil and not paying any attention to your soil health is. All right, so let's get back to biostimulants. That original uh, concept of losing yield by virtue of stress and biostimulants and the microbiome and soil health contributing to the ability of a plant to respond in an ideal fashion as the environment varies. All right. So with that hypothesis that biostimulants allow the plant to effectively respond to stress and more efficiently use their resources, some questions come up. And the big one, and this be relevant for Gary in a moment, is how do we predict what stress is going to occur? Because you've got to apply your biostimulants before you get the stress. You can't do it after you get the stress. What process is the particular biostimulant that you are planning on using? What is it targeting? Now, a lot of the biostimulants right now will be labeled with, helps with stress, helps with nutrient use up to, up, up, uptake, helps with drought, helps with heat, helps with frost. Well, they can't do all of those things. And an initial question whenever choosing biostimulants is, what am I trying to solve? What is the challenge here? And has this product been tested in that context? The third one is, you know, do you get a penalty from using one of these biostimulants if there was no stress? Bear in mind what all of these biostimulants are doing is turning on innate plant protection mechanisms, okay? They're indicating to the plant, if I could use that terminology, it is time to protect yourself, okay? They're not creating new pathways, they're only controlling them. So you could ask yourself the question, if the plant always had this ability within it to tolerate this stress, why does it not do it all by itself all the time? And the answer is, it's expensive. It's expensive to my yield, it's expensive to my growth. So if I spray something on that tricks the plant into upregulating its drought stress, but there is no drought stress, it's logical to assume there's a cost. Of course, there's always the cost of, lose, of, not, of spending money on something you didn't need. How does this vary for cropping systems, cultivar, your particular environmental conditions? That's another important question. What are your soil health conditions? Where are you within uh, California? How long do these things last? When do you need to spray them if you see a heat wave coming or a cold spell coming? 
Is it a week, two weeks, or a month? And how do we do the research? So this complexity of some of this, a couple of figures here. On the left, we've got radiation intensity, we've got water stress intensity, temperature, and differences in plant growth. And I only put this in here, this crosses over five, four different years, five different years, is to say, you know, these characteristics in the field are incredibly variable. So if I were to ask you, what is the critical temperature, high temperature, at which avocado fruit set will be compromised? I don't think you'd be able to answer that. You might say, well, five days at 95 degrees or higher would be a problem. But really, is it four days? Is it six days? Is it 95 or is it 98? These are things that are not scientifically well described, though the best of the growers in this audience, I think, have a good sense of where those challenges are and which events cause trouble. Remember, we're not thinking about the extremes. We're not talking about a 10-day frost. We're talking about the subtleties. A lot more chemistry here than you know. We're starting to learn how these products work. Okay, this is sort of a metabolic pathway from uh, sensing the stress, whichever stress it happens to be. And as I mentioned, increasingly we're recognizing that it's the microbes in the environment that do the sensing on behalf of the plant. And then you get a cascade of responses until finally you get the crop response. Biostimulants work in this realm, but exactly how they work, we don't yet know. So that adds to the complexity. When you talk about microbes, it's a whole more complicated game. You know, this is one gram of soil and only the species of microbes that we could detect. So if we're talking about microbial interactions, a huge amount of complexity here. As a result of all of this, when companies run their research trials, you often get these kinds of results. So 150 trials of a product, in this case, uh, measuring tons per hectare, I think this was a, a, a corn crop, and you've got precisely half of the trials, you lose money, either because the yield went down or because you caught, there was a cost associated with that product. Half of the trials, positive effects, sometimes tremendous effects. Now, it's tempting and it's classic way of thinking in agriculture that, well, 50% winners, 50% losers, or no use. But in the context of biostimulants, the question really should be, what was going on in these environments that resulted in a response. And if I knew that, and I was growing my plants in these environments, I wouldn't use a biostimulant. So this is not a demonstration they don't work. It is a demonstration that we need to put this information in the right context and make the right decision. Now, as I said, this is a really exciting area amongst the agrochemical companies. And this is just a list of the mergers and acquisitions over the last three years. And you will see the big names, Nutrient, Trade Corp, Enterovance, Accortiva, FMC, Verdesian, all buying biostimulant companies in the last three years, four years. So when you have all these big boys betting on, I think you can conclude there is something here. There is some there, there, okay? You can also conclude that the field is going to change. It's going to change from small backyard biostimulant producer extracting some leftover seed waste to the Syngentas and the Cortivas and the Vedesians of the world dedicating resources. And the reason, as I said, is because of the pressure initially from the European Union to move away from non-biological agricultural chemicals. So I'm gonna finish up with an example of an experiment we did to illustrate all of these points I just talked about. And this is a trial that we did in tomatoes and we did it in the context of all of what I've just told you. Thinking about the stress, thinking about the timing, thinking about the products. We used in this case, 16 different products and I'm only gonna 
right? So we tested 16 products of which four worked. Now that doesn't mean all biostimulants don't work. It means you need to know in which context. This trial was done in transplanted field tomato, which is a pretty high stress situation. These seedlings have to get down into the sub-irrigation zone and start growing against the background of hot weather in Davis in June. We did a ton of monitoring because we really wanted to know where we're in this stress continuum and under what circumstances and time of year these biostimulants had an effect. We measured these things all through the year. And what really matters here is the difference between the red and the blue. And you can see through most of the year, there was what you would perceive as no stress. As little as three days long, where you had an extra water stress. This is vapor pressure deficit here on, on, the, on the yellow. And as it turns out, it was these little windows that made all the difference. And I'll show you how in just a second. So this is a measurement during that peak of vapor pressure deficit, peak of temperature in this field. And we're measuring leafature, untreated control, and then uh, treated biostimulants. Four of them, they were the only ones that had any effect. And the leaf temperature has dropped four or five degrees. Now that might not seem much, but it is an indication that these biostimulant treated plants were still photosynthesizing. This was at the beginning, uh, just, uh, just post fruit set, early red breaker, that sort of window in tomato production or for final yield. Critical because it determines how many fruit are set and it determines the early uh, rate of growth of those fruit. And when you translate this, what was only about a seven day difference in leaf temperature into final tonnage, control 42 tons, treated 68 tons. And in fact, the 68 tons yield, these, 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 this experiment was run under a 30% water deficit compared with ET. This 68 tons almost matched the fully watered control. So with $12 an acre of biostimulant, we recovered 30% large, multi, um, uh, well-replicated experiment. So sometimes you get extraordinary effects. And the only reason I still work in this realm is because of these things. We very clearly... Plant production quite Patrick, quite, can, can you repeat that because we lost you right there and i know this sure. is a very important point you want to make sure absolutely so just to reiterate um the key effect of the biostimulants was maintaining lower leaf temperatures which is an indication of maintaining photosynthesis when contrasted between a control in which we uh, reduce 30 percent of the water we induced a mild water stress the biostimulants took the tonnage from 42 tons fresh weight to 68 tons fresh weight, 59 tons fresh weight, 65 tons fresh weight, 51 tons fresh weight. So really extraordinary differences. In this case, this was a, a, a bacillus subtilis, bacillus amylophations mixture from Bayer, Serenade, I think they sell it as, that was injected at you know, 12 ounces an acre once during the year. So extraordinary response here that indicates that some of these materials, at best four out of 16, really did mitigate the stress effect that these tomato plants were sensing, essentially preventing the fruit drop, preventing the slowdown in fruit size that would occur normally under water stress conditions immediately post flowering in tomato. Okay, I mentioned previously, a lot of biostimulants are sold on the nutrient fertilizer realm. And I just put this to illustrate 
you got to be careful of that claim. It's certainly true that this biostimulant, all of these biostimulants improve the efficiency of nutrients. More of the nitrogen in the soil, therefore you're more efficient. Okay. So that's what this interaction shows. And uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, you, you disappeared just as you were talking about fertilizer uptake by these products. Okay. So the effect you see here, this is nutrient use efficiency going from 44% to 74%, 100% attributable to the better growth and the better yield. Okay. These products didn't cause more nutrient uptake. These products caused more growth. More growth means you use more resources, means you're more efficient. And a lot of the nutrient use claims of biostimulants are a consequence of this effect, not necessarily a nutrient mobilization or a nutrient uh, solubilization in the soil. Some biostimulants work that way, but these ones don't. So how do you put this all together? Usually first I show a corn crop. You're trying to interrupt the stress events in a cropping system. So when you think of the case of corn, which we have this nice picture for, intuitively and because of experience, most growers know where the stress points are, okay? Early seedling established in corn, it's about cold, it's about waterlogging. Not often in corn growing regions is it about drought. As you get into flowering, there are wind events and temperature events that a corn grower knows will cause trouble. And ideally, there would be a choice of a biostimulant for that purpose in that context. In the case of avocado, of course, life is way more complicated. It seems avocado has more complicated everything. But you can still think as a grower, of the same series of events is what do I know will take a 10,000 pound crop down to 4,000 pounds, a heat spell, a wind spell, something like that. And is there a company there that is got experience, got evidence that they're as fruits start to set? Do we have that evidence? We lost you again, right? As you were making the key point there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, put it down to the storms. Um, <clears throat> in avocado, but I think through experience, you know, good consultants, good growers know where the weaknesses are in the cropping cycle, know where a dangerous drought, a dangerous wind, a high temperature spell, a cold spell can make a profound impact. Those are the events that you should be thinking about. What can I do as I see this cold front coming just during bloom? Is there a product that demonstrates a benefit in that context? Is there a product that has a, of that effect? Now, you're not going to have a lot, and Gary will tell you in a moment, not going to have a lot of this for avocado, but there will be some products that have demonstrated this effect in corn or tomato or something else that they protect the plant from a heat spell post-flowering that might be able to translate. So when we start to put it sort of all together, it, it becomes pretty clear in the next iteration of agricultural production we're going to have to go away from what we've typically done. That is measure the pH, level the soil, adjust it with gypsum, add the fertilizers. We're going to have to go to what is the suite of microbes in my soil look like? And, and, and where are some weaknesses in the cropping system resilience? I can't say we can do this yet, but it's clearly where we're going. And then potentially, are there any points in here where you would choose a biostimulant because you know you need to solve a problem? We're aiming for you know something that resembles this resilient cropping system. Now, obviously, we're not growing pastures and we're not growing legumes, and this would be an impossible system to make anything out of unless you were a cow. Um, so we can't do that in our cropping systems. We can do better than what. 
So best practices, how to put it all together. Certainly, there is research on stress biology and the microbiome and biostimulants that tell us plants perceive these subtle stresses and plants make decisions on an evolutionary survival basis that are not ideal for agricultural production. And there is evidence we can intervene here. Biostimulants may, ones of may, have a significant potential to increase yield by mitigating these effects. You know, over the years, people have asked me, well, how many of these things work? 12 years ago at that first conference, I would have told you 99% don't work and 1% got lucky. I think if I was asked that question today, I'd say, yeah, 90% don't work. 5% know what they're doing and 5% got lucky. So that's not a perfect recipe, but I think we've got to be careful not to throw away that 5% and say, this is all smoke and mirrors and snake oils. There's something here. Uh, are we there yet? No, and I think Gary will show you some of the complexities. I think it's absolutely true that one of the reasons biostimulants have some role is because our cropping systems are not very resilient. Our floors of our orchards, our soil health is not what it should be. Uh, and you know, it's just a question of what's easier, fix the underlying problem with soil health mitigation or intervene with some of these products that are a little bit more amenable with normal production practices. Fundamentally, Anybody buying a stimulant needs to go in there and ask the question, what am I trying to solve? You know, when I think about my, my avocado crop and I think I've got 10,000 pounds up there and all of a sudden half of it's on the ground, what happened and what could I have done about it? These are the questions. And that's where you have to interrogate those selling these products and see if they can give you a rational uh, answer to this. Now, of course, some of those consultants and sales guys have seen my talk and now they have a nice answer to this question uh, only because they know the question's coming, not because they really know the answer. That may be a little bit cynical. Then we'll talk about testing. Of course, these are difficult things to test. Gary's gonna touch on that, so I'm not gonna do it. It's hard for a grower to do. And in the absence of that, you have to press the company and, and have them prove they did it. With that, Thank you very much. And I apologize for the bad connection. Thank you, Patrick, very much. And uh, perhaps as we talk that maybe you could, if you have time, you could re-record it, <laughs> send us a recording. It would be great because it was a very fascinating talk. We do have one question that I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, it said, you referenced nitrogen use efficiencies with biostimulants. Do you have any thoughts as it relates to phosphorus and potassium and other and micronutrients? Yeah, potassium has been a focus for some of the biostimulants because there are a number of phosphorus solubilizing bacteria that are being sold as biostimulants. Okay. Um, there's a few things that are uh, not yet clear about those products is They've been shown to work in natural environments when the soil phosphorus is in the nanomolar, it is in really, really low concentration. They can solubilize phosphorus from really, really low concentration and make it just adequate, okay? That is not the reality in our agricultural soils. We're already many orders of magnitude higher in phosphorus. And once soil phosphorus is at a, uh, an adequate soil level, uh, those bacteria don't work anymore. They turn off because there's no challenge. So the evidence in the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria is a little bit soft. Um, people are still attempting that, but they haven't overcome the problem that the bacteria turn themselves off as soon as phosphorus turns up. Um, nothing in the potassium realm that I am aware of. And you always have to be careful with what I showed you in that tomato. If you make the plant grow more, it will take more. And it's not the other way around. It's not growing more because it got more. It's, it's taking more because it grew more. Uh, it turns up as a nutrient use efficiency effect just because that's a mathematical equation, but it doesn't have any implications that it actually helped solubilize nutrients in the environment. Now, as I said, this area is changing so quickly that uh, while I've been speaking, something else has appeared in the realm. So things can change. 
Great. Well, we have a couple more questions showing up in the chat, so maybe you can look at that while Gary is speaking, and then we can come back and address those comments um, after Gary has given his talk. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Gary Bender, who is going to talk about it from hopefully a practical perspective of how a grower can tell what they should do when they're approached by these new, uh, find out about these new products. 